upgrade, etc. That's right, okay. That's the way to go. In edit. Fusion takes white advice, which is more advice. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Uh, unfortunately, due to Brexit, I have to correct you, so I, I'm not allowed to say I'm funded by the ERC. I'm funded by the emergency Brexit replacement in the UK, which is, uh, <laughs> which is a, source of, a source of great regret. Uh, I, I'm glad that we will be rejoining the ERC uh, as a country as soon as possible. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, it's re really great to be back in Munster. Uh, I've been here many times and I've lo got lots of uh, really good friends here. So uh, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me. Um, this is a broad conference, so I want to talk about operator algebras, so let me start out with a primordial example, which is bounded operators on a Hilbert space. So I give you a separable input dimensional Hilbert space, and I consider all of the continuous linear operators on it. And of course, uh, if I want continuity, I have to ask for it, because when you first learn linear algebra, nobody bothers you about whether your map is continuous or not, because you are working in finite dimensions, and all linear maps in finite dimensions will be continuous. But in infinite dimensions, if I want continuity, I have to impose it, uh, and we can impose it by asking uh, for the operators involved to be bounded. And then the collection of bounded operators has uh, sort of two batches of structure. It has structure as an algebra. I can compose operators, and again, I get a uh, bounded operator, or I can perform uh, the adjoint operator in finite dimensions. That's just going to be a uh, conjugate transpose when I think of my operator as a matrix. Uh, but it's also got analytic structure, the, the norm of the operator uh, that tells me how, how much uh, my operator can amplify vectors. Of course, the thing I, I really like about, about this subject is the interplay between the analysis and the algebra. And that's all uh, hidden in an identity that I didn't put on the board, but a very famous identity that says uh, that the norm of T star T is precisely the norm of T squared. And, and somehow this, this fundamental operate, uh, identity about the norm of operators really melds together the analysis uh, and the algebra. Uh, so I'm uh, interested in, in operator algebras, and I want to cheat by, by defining them as substructures. So I'm going to take this B of H, and I'm going to consider subalgebras of it. So it, it's a bit of a fib. It's like I was turning up and introducing a group to you and saying, well, a group is a subgroup of a permutation group. True, but, but not very insightful. Uh, and I want to do the same here. Uh, an operator algebra is a subalgebra of this canonical example but really, of course, un underlying this is an abstract characterization, and it's a theorem that operator algebras have enough representations that I can do what I've done on this slide. So uh, they come in two fundamental flavors. Uh, there are two, but there are many natural topologies on B of H, but I want to think of two of them, the topology introduced by the norm and the topology given by pointwise convergence. So I can ask my star subalgebras of B of H to be norm closed, or I can ask for them to be closed in the topology of pointwise convergence. So if you're seeing this for the first time, these definitions are going to look pretty similar. It's like you go to the playground, there's two young children, they're siblings. They look very similar. Um, you can't tell the difference between them, but as you get to know them better, you realize that their personalities are, are quite different. One of them often exhibits uh, quite poor behavior, uh, for example, whereas the other one uh, <laughs> is on their best behavior at all times. Uh, and that happens here too, so, uh, so our Cesar algebras have the personality of topology, whereas our von Neumann algebras have the personality of measurability, and this is seen in the commutative subalgebra. So uh, if I've got a commutative Cesar algebra, it's a theorem that it's of the form the continuous functions that vanish at infinity on some compact Hausdorff space. Uh, of course, to fit with my framework, I've got to tell you how that acts on some Hilbert space, and the way I would do it is by uh, having D0 of x act on uh, the space L2 of x with some measure on x by left multiplication. Whereas every von Neumann algebra is the algebra of essentially bounded measurable functions uh, on uh, some measure space. Uh, and so again here, uh, there's a theorem that tells us that this is the case. And it's not just that these commutative examples uh, provide a connection between topology and measure theory, but it really pervades the subject. So when you sort of see a Cester algebra, it's intrinsically topological, and, and the sort of invariants we want to work with are non-commutative analogs of invariants from topology, whereas when we're playing with, uh, uh, with von Neumann algebras, 
the, the style of measure theory uh, sort of pervades the argument. So indeed, it is the, the, topology, uh, the topology side, which, which can sometimes be pathological. And uh, on the measurable side, of course, there's pathological behavior, but it happens on a set of measure zero, and we can throw it away. So that is why, why in general, we, we can expect um, some slightly difficult, uh, more difficulties on the feast charge. So what are we aiming to do uh, in this talk? I want to describe some, some structure and classification results for Seaster algebras. Uh, they've really been the work of the community over the last uh, 50 years, and I want to draw the parallels uh, between uh, what's happened on the Seaster side uh, and what happened for von Neumann algebras uh, in the 1970s. So we're aiming for uh, classification of large families of these operator algebras uh, up to isomorphism by invariants that you, at least in reasonable examples, have a chance of getting your hands on computing and deciding whether your algebras are or aren't isomorphic. Uh, and I want that to go in parallel with structural theorems that enable you to decide when is an operator algebra within the class we can classify. Uh, and, and I'd like to also go back and say, okay, well, we've classified everything. What structure do we uncover inside our, oper our operator algebra that we didn't know was there? Uh, beforehand. Uh, okay, so uh, on the von Neumann algebra side, this happened between the 1940s and the 1970s, and, and I'll describe uh, these theorems uh, in a bit. Firstly, Murray and von Neumann proved a, a really striking uh, classification theorem, and then uh, in his Fields Medal winning work, Alan Com proved the structural theorem that enables you uh, to access it. So the, uh, the talk, the results I'm describing are really the topological analogy of these uh, von Neumann results, uh, the so-called uh, Elliott program, uh, which has been ongoing uh, for many. Okay, but before all of that, we should have some examples, and I want to uh, focus on the examples that Shirley introduced uh, in her talk yesterday afternoon. So uh, I cheated and defined operator algebras as collections of operators on the Hilbert space, closed under multiplication, closed under uh, the vector space operations, closed under the adjoint, and closed in the appropriate topology. So, for example, if you've got your favorite mathematical object and you can find a way of representing your mathematical object on a Hilbert space as families of operators, you'll naturally get an operator algebra. So if you like groups, look at unitary representations of groups, take the algebra they generate and you'll get a Seaster algebra and you'll get a von Neumann algebra. If you like uh, group actions, you can do the same. I'll describe it in a minute. If you like graphs, you can find a way of, of representing uh, data about graphs on a Hilbert space and building algebras from it. Uh, there are now constructions associated to number fields, semi-groups, uh, etc. So the basic idea is if you can represent it on a Hilbert space, you can transfer from your original underlying piece of mathematics to something at the level of operator algebras. And then a fundamental question is when you do this, how much information do you retain? How much do you lose? Is this actually useful? Can you uh, use this process to see things about the underlying mathematical object that, that was more difficult uh, in other ways. So here I've got a group acting on a space. Maybe that space is a uh, compact house door space. Maybe it's a measurable space, and that will depend whether I want to construct uh, a Seaster algebra or a von Neumann algebra. But of course, I can take the dual action, so I can induce a, an action on functions, uh, and in this way, the group will act on, in this case, the continuous function. Uh, on X. So my favorite example is that of irrational rotation. I have a circle and I have uh, the integers acting on the circle by uh, multiplication by an irrational multiple of uh, two pi. And of course, as I do this, the, the, you know, every orbit in that action is dense, which means if I do something really classical on the topology side, say, consider the quotient space of that action, I get something fundamentally uninteresting. I get an uncountable set with the indiscrete topology, and I lose all information about the action. Uh, so what I want to do is construct something non-commutative. Uh, I'll do it in the, in the spirit of the semi-direct product of groups. So I put this uh, algebra C of X inside some larger non-commutative algebra in such a way that the action now becomes inner. So that is, uh, instead of alpha G of F being given by this formula, alpha G of F is given by an inner automorphism uh, UG uh, F UG star for some family of unitaries implementing the action. 
And, and I could write down an explicit formula for how this is done and take the operator algebra uh, it generates. The explicit formula is uninteresting, or at least uh, for the purpose of this talk, which is why I'm, I'm not giving it. But the construction I get, at least in the examples I'm interested in, uh, when the group is reasonably small, will be independent of the, of the way I chose to do this, so I really get a way of associating uh, operator algebras to these group actions. So this uh, classic example of the irrational rotation, I, I form an irrational rotation algebra uh, A theta. It's the cross product of continuous functions on the circle by the integers. And then there's going to be two unit trees, the unit tree that generates the continuous function on the circle. So that's the, the operator that sends uh, multiplication by uh, z. And then an operator V implementing the action. And these unit trees uh, don't commute, but they commute up to multiplication by the, the angle. And in this way, I think of this theta algebra as a sort of non-commutative uh, torus. OK, so uh, that's examples from group actions. Of course, the most basic type of action is to act on the one-point set. Uh, so I have the trivial action of every group on the one-point set. Uh, and if I do this, then the construction I've just described reduces to uh, unitary representations of groups on Hilbert spaces. And I'm going to get two uh, different constructions, one uh, in the norm topology uh, and one in the uh, strong operator topology, giving me a Theta algebra and a von Neumann algebra, respectively. And these constructions then generalize the Fourier transform for locally compact abelian groups. So if, if G is abelian, D star G, the, the operator algebra generated by this left regular representation of G on a Hilbert space. That is an abelian Seaster algebra, so it must be continuous functions on something, and that something is the Fourier dual group. Likewise, if I do the von Neumann uh, process and I look at the von Neumann algebra generated by G, uh, that's going to be, if G is abelian, an abelian von Neumann algebra, it must be L infinity functions on something, and the something is the Fourier dual group. So let's take the, the group Z, for example. So the reduced group Z algebra Z is the continuous functions on the circle. The uh, von Neumann algebra Z is the uh, L infinity, the essentially bounded functions on the circle. Uh, but you'll notice that if I, if I replace Z with Z squared at the level of topology, the circle and the torus are not homeomorphic. The C star algebra associated to Z and the C star algebra associated to Z squared must be non-isomorphic. At the level of measure theory, these spaces are measure equivalent. The von Neumann algebras here carry less information than the C-star. And that's going to be a phenomenon that uh, goes on uh, throughout this talk. OK, so uh, we've had an example coming from uh, group actions. We've had an example uh, coming from groups. I now want to look at a more internal example and build up a, a family of operator algebras uh, directly. So let me start out with the, the most simple example of an operator algebra, which is the, the complex number. And I can put the complex numbers inside the 2 by 2 matrices by embedding it uh, down the diagonal uh, as shown. So the, the number A goes to the diagonal matrix uh, AA, like this. And then I can put, you know, now consider all 2 by 2 matrices and put them inside the 4 by 4 matrices by repeating that process. So where I had uh, A11 in the top left-hand corner, now I have the diagonal matrix A11, A11, and similarly uh, in all uh, entries. And I carry on, uh, but to avoid typesetting problems, uh, I delete all of the entries, but you carry on at each stage, um, embedding each corner into the 2 by 2 matrices uh, in this way by just putting it diagonal. And so all of that gives me a, a chain of operator algebras, C inside M2, inside M4, inside M8. And I can consider the union of all of these things. Because if I do consider the union uh, of all of these things, that will not necessarily be complete. And in fact, it will, it will fail to be complete. So uh, I would like to find a way of, of representing all of this on a Hilbert space so that I get uh, an operator algebra. And the way I do so keeps track of the, of the trace. So notice that this construction is, is completely compatible with the normalized trace on the 2 by 2 matrices. So here we uh, see the 2 by 2 matrices again. And when I perform this operation, because a half of uh, the sum of the two diagonal entries is going to be uh, equal to a quarter of the sum of the four diagonal entries uh, under this operation, 
this inductive limit process that I perform has a well-defined trace uh, on the uh, inductive limit. So then what I wish to do is to take this inductive limit, I want to plonk it somehow on a Hilbert space and close it up, and of course I can do so in either the topology of norm convergence and get something topological, or I can do so in the topology of strong operator convergence and get something measured. Uh, so let's, let's do that. Uh, it actually, I want to do so in such a way that the trace extends uh, to, these clo to these closures. Uh, that's done using the GNS representation for the trace, for those uh, who've seen these sort of things. And for those who haven't, just uh, take my word for the fact that you can do this. So I'll get uh, a Caesar algebra, which I'm writing as M to infinity, uh, and a von Neumann algebra, which I'm writing as R, and, and spoiler alert, the notation uh, was there for a reason, so the two uh, is present in the notation I'm using for a von Neumann algebra because I'll be able to see the two-ness of the construction, sorry, in the Caesar algebra because I'll be able to see the two-ness of this construction at the topological level, whereas at the level of von Neumann algebras, uh, the, the size of the matrices uh, I used will, will disappear and, and not be present as something. Uh, and read off. Let's make that uh, more precise. So the first uh, classification theorem in this business is due to Murray and von Neumann from 1945, and it says that there exists a unique hyperfinite infinite dimensional simple von Neumann algebra of a trace acting on a separable Hilbert space. So there's a, a lot of words there, there's a lot of adjectives, this is sort of I inevitable when one, one talks about an area of mathematics, and I've, I've tried to colour them in in two flavours. So the blue words, uh, although there's lots of them, I encourage you to, to regard them as quite friendly. These are, these are not too technical. So, for example, simple here means no ideals. By an ideal, I mean closed in the appropriate topology, so in the strong operator topology of pointwise convergence, uh, and two-sided um, with a trace. Well, we've seen what I meant by a trace, and this is something extending the idea of the trace on a matrix algebra. Um, and uh, in what has become, unfortunately, a bit of a competition in the area, so Murray and von Neumann um, rightly identified this, this group of adjectives as an important class in its own right, and then it's been extremely competitive to introduce uh, terminology that doesn't really carry meaning, and, and the first entry of this was to call these a 2-1 factor. So we're stuck with this terminology, um, and I will use it, but it's not really... I think, terminology that explains what's going on. The word in red is, is potentially more scary, and it's certainly harder to verify. So this is the, the terminology of hyperfinite. So what was important in the previous example is, you know, I took the closure of an increasing family of, of finite dimensional algebras. So if I take anything in that closure, I must be able to approximate it by something in a finite dimensional algebra. And that's what I mean uh, by hyperfinite. Um, and so what they proved is that there's one and only one way of doing this, which means that if I start with the 3x3 three three matrices, embed them in the 9x9 nine nine matrices and the 27x27 27 27 matrices, and close in the von Neumann level, I must get the same thing. But then you could ask, well, what happens with those other examples? If I give you a group, when can I verify the blue conditions? And it turns out there's a very clean condition for that. And when can I verify the red condition? that's harder. So if I want to see a group von Neumann algebra as an inductive limit of finite dimensional things, maybe the only obvious way to do that is to take a group which was already an inductive limit of finite groups. So if I take the group of all finitely supported permutations on the natural numbers, uh, that will fit into Murray and von Neumann and this framework. But for other groups, it could be very difficult to decide when this classification theorem actually applies. So I, I really find this theorem uh, I find it immensely beautiful. I get to work through it um, pretty regularly. Most graduate students enjoy working through the proof of this theorem, but then you explain to them, but actually it's not very useful because you'll never be able to check the hypothesis. Um, and so that's what Alan Kahn did for us. He, he found a way of, of turning the red uh, definition of hyperfiniteness and making it blue. So without giving you the definition, what he did was abstractly characterize this concept of hyperfiniteness into something intrinsic and checkable. It turns out to be something that's equivalent to uh, amenability for groups. So it's uh, an operator algebraic characterization of amenability for groups for a discrete group G. G will be amenable if and only if it's 
operator algebra is amenable. Now, we were talking about this over breakfast, like can you give a one-sentence uh, explanation of what amenability is using words that everybody can understand, and the answer to that is, is no, uh, but that's not the subject of this talk. So I want to basically take the view that amenability is a, a central theme in, in group theory that you know, turns up wherever groups meet analysis, you'll be able to characterize uh, amenability uh, in this in, in your preferred language, and we can do so here with operator algebra. And it's readily uh, verifiable in examples. So all of those von Neumann algebras associated to irrational rotations, they come from cross products by totally reasonable groups like the integers. The group is amenable, the cross product is amenable. I lose all of the information when I apply uh, pass from the group and group action to the von Neumann algebra in this. Okay, so how did um, so how does this go? So really, it is the the point I want to make is it's this marriage of the structural theorem of Kahn and the classification theorem of Murray and von Neumann that gives us something really useful. It gives us the unique uh, amenable to one factor. Uh, and today, it's sort of impossible to imagine doing von Neumann algebras without this theorem. So it's provided a, a classification of all. Uh, traceless hyperfinite uh, factors. We completely understand amenable von Neumann algebras. The theorem provided classification of uh, amenable measurable dynamics. And in all of the breakthrough progress that's happened in von Neumann algebras and its interaction with dynamics and subfactors ever since, somewhere that this theorem is being used. It's, it's impossible to, to write a paper on von Neumann algebras, I think, that doesn't implicitly use uh, this theorem. Uh, I want to highlight, I mean, Con's work was a huge tour de force. It's a very uh, technically demanding and, and, and inspirational paper. Uh, and I want to pick out just one detail and come back to it uh, later in the talk, which is that that inductive limit construction could also be viewed as an infinite tensor product. So you could view the four by four matrices as a tensor product of two copies of the two by two matrices. And then that diagonal map is just the map that sends two by two matrix A to A tensor the identity in two by two matrices tensor the two by two matrices. Of course, if you are completing an infinite tensor product, well, you've got an infinite tensor product, you can just, you know, re-bracket it and say, I'll, I'll identify an infinite tensor product with two copies of itself by keeping, say, all of the copies associated to odd natural numbers in the indexing set in one side and all copies associated even natural numbers in the other side. And in this way, I get an isomorphism between the infinite algebraic tensor product of copies of the two by two matrices and two copies of itself. And this persists when I perform the closure operation. So R is necessarily isomorphic to R tensor R. So as a tensor unit, it satisfies the identity R squared equals R. The co course R is not either zero or one. It's something highly uh, non commuting And so a key step in, in Kahn's proof is to show that R acts as a tensor unit on everything that he purports to classify. You take this amenable 2-1 factor that you eventually claim must be R, let's call it M, and you first show that M is at least isomorphic to M tensor R, which will be necessary uh, if such a classification theorem is to hold. Okay, so that's the, the von Neumann side. I want to turn now to the CSAR uh, side of the picture, and of course, as I planted the seed earlier, you can see the size of these uh, matrices in the construction. So the two by two uh, process gives me something different to the three by three process. And the reason is to do with the difference in the nature of these approximations. If I try to approximate the uh, projection onto the top left entry in the two by two matrices by something in uh, a matrix algebra of size three to the n by three to the n. If I'm going to do that approximation in norm, you'll be able to check that the projection I get has to have the same rank, has to have the same trace. And of course, there is no uh, projection of trace a half in the three to the n by three to the n matrices. Whereas if I approximate in the strong operator topology, I can approximate something of trace a half by something that's triadic by writing a half as a third plus a ninth plus a 27th, et cetera, and that convergence will be allowed in the strong operator topology. That's, of course, a little ad hoc, so we should do something less ad hoc, and, and the less ad hoc thing to do is, is to define uh, K-theory for operator algebras 
as the non-commutative extension of a tier in Hertzberg's topological K theory for spaces. So we should think of these uh, projections that I uh, had up there in matrices over my operator algebras providing non-commutative uh, vector bundles. Uh, and so I, I've written down what the K groups uh, are for these examples. They're given by uh, all rationals whose denominator is coming from the, uh, the matrix sizes involved. Okay, well, what other invariants are there for Seaster algebras? Well, the other canonical invariant I want to consider is this trace where there is a unique trace for R, uh, Seaster algebras which turn out to be uh, analogous to the hyperfinite 2 1 factor. These could have many traces. So if you go back to this uh, cross product construction, it was explained by Shirley uh, yesterday that provided the action is reasonably nice uh, and the group is reasonably nice, that traces on this co cross product construction correspond to something dynamical, they correspond to invariant measures under the group action. So in the case of the irrational rotation on the circle, because of the irrationality, the only invariant measure will be the Lebesgue measure, and the only trace on the irrational rotation algebra uh, will be uh, the trace associated with Lebesgue. And so uh, in that example, we've got a unique invariant measure, a unique trace on this cross product. You can calculate the K-theory. I mean, one of the things about K-theory is there are really great tools uh, for calculating it. Uh, in this case, the K-theory turns out to be exactly what it would have been in the commutative situation, in the situation where I was looking at the continuous functions on the torus. So the K-theory gives me uh, Z plus Z in both coordinates. There's a unique trace. And neither the K-theory nor the trace distinguish these algebras. But I can use the trace to embed the k naught group in R. And when I do that, um, the k naught group, this copy of Z plus Z, becomes uh, one copy of Z and one copy of theta modulo 2 pi of Z. So I get the group Z plus 2 pi of Z inside the copy of R. And now I see theta, or at least I see theta up to uh, multiplication by plus and minus 1 and multiplication and uh, integer multiples of 2 pi. So neither the trace nor the k-theory carries enough data to classify, but the trace plus the k-theory classifies uh, irrational rotation algebras. And while we couldn't say, OK, let's pass to a quotient space construction and expect to understand uh, the underlying dynamics, if we pass to this non-commutative construction, uh, information about the underlying dynamics uh, is still present. So what has been going on over the last uh, 40 years or so uh, is the quest for the analogous version of, of Conn's theorems. So this was a, a program uh, started by George Eliot somewhere between the late 70s and his ICM talk where he, in the 1994 where he conjectured that it should be possible to classify simple, separable, amenable Seaster algebras by K-theory and trace. So here, amenability is now being characterized operator algebraically. It's a condition I, I want to persuade you is a blue condition. It's something you can check uh, in examples, although I don't want to give uh, that definition. And so if I build something from countable discrete groups, the something I build should be amenable when uh, the groups uh, and everything else involved in the construction was amenable. So it really is looking for the analogous class on the topological side to what we had on the map. So, I mean, it, it was a bit of an ambitious conjecture when it was made. It, it feels like, you know, you've got those two y young children in the playground and the, the older one has, has successfully done something. And so the younger one just has to do it as well, whether or not they're ready, whether or not they're big enough. And really, perhaps they need to wait a few years. Uh, and that's what's happened here. Quite a few years uh, needed to pass while uh, Seaster algebras grew up to the stage that we were able to, uh, to prove such a theorem. And it went... Uh, in many stages. So let me just, uh, I want to steal from George some of his uh, iconography. So on the left hand side, I've got the class of simple, separable, amenable Caesar algebras. I've got this invariant of K theory and traces. And I want to know whether if I've got two things on the left hand side that have the same invariant uh, on the right hand side, is there an isomorphism between A and B that lifts the isomorphism of the invariant? And when that's the case, I will view A and B as classified. It's a bit of a vague uh, definition. So we started out with uh, 
this small bubble uh, in 1976. And what George Eliot did is he took the, the hyperfinite definition for von Neumann algebras and said, consider those Seastar algebras which are inductive limits of finite dimensional things. Let's classify those. Uh, and he achieved this. But in contrast to Conn's theorem, where that bubble filled up the whole space, it really is a very tiny bubble in the world of simple separable uh, Seastar algebras because uh, finite dimensional algebras will have trivial K1 and everything with non-trivial K1 therefore can't be an inductive limit of finite dimensional algebra. But the bubble slowly grew. Uh, people considered more general inductive limits, more general classes. The growth rate wasn't uniform. That big one is the Kirchberg-Phillips theorem in the 90s, which was the first uh, truly abstract classification. So it was a class where that met this sort of characterization I was trying to give you earlier on, where the, the, the hypotheses were readily checkable in examples. But it still wasn't everything, and the bubble continued to grow and, and grow, and, and the question has been, uh, how far can we get it? Can we push this all the way uh, out to the boundary, or do we have to stop at some point? And that happened uh, in around 2000s. There were, you know, the Seastar algebras, can sometimes behave very badly, and, and there were some extremely pathological examples uh, produced by Jasper Wilderson uh, in the late 90s, which were converted to this uh, statement here, that there is a simple inductive limit of Easter algebras built out of matrices over spaces, which you won't be classifying by k and traces, and you won't be classifying by anything else you can practically compute. So there's a precise statement on the slide, but what it says is, However, you decided these, isom uh, th these algebras were not isomorphic to some other algebra, you will not be readily computing that invariant in large number of examples. So instead of trying to push, you know, enlarge the class of invariants, because we kind of insist that classifications must be useful and we must be able to get hold of the invariants, the strategy is that instead we have to find what is the, the precise dividing line that separates the classifiable from the non classifiable. So let's go back to that little thing uh, I flagged about R about being uh, isomorphic to its own tensor square. So if, if you're going to pursue this analogy between Seastar algebras and von Neumann algebras, you can ask, well, what is the right Seastar version of that construction? Because we saw some, right? I mean, if we're looking for a Seastar algebra that's isomorphic to its tensor square, the most obvious one is the complex numbers. But also, we could take the infinite tensor product of the 2 by 2 matrices. That will be isomorphic to its tensor square, or the infinite tensor product of the 3 by 3 matrices. But as we know that there was a choice there, if I want to get rid of the choice, I could take with the infinite tensor product of the 2 by 2 matrices, with the infinite tensor product of the 3 by 3 matrices, and so on. But now I'll get something that's way too big. So what I really want, of course, is an algebra D with the property that when I tensor it by any Seastar algebra, it's at least a, an identity at the level of invariant. And you can check that that kills the option of M2 infinity or M3 infinity, uh, because tensoring by those will destroy uh, torsion at the appropriate, um, the appropriate order in case. Okay, so, so this was discovered in the late 90s. It was an infinite dimensional, separable, unital, amenable Seastar algebra, which I'll call Z with the same invariant as the complex numbers. When it was discovered, the construction was quite intricate, um, quite technical, and then there was another construction which was quite intricate and quite technical, and all these constructions depended on, on lots of choices, but whenever you did them, you always got the same thing. And it kind of feels to me that if you, you, know, if you do something that's somewhat unnatural in many different ways and you always get the same thing, something natural must actually be be going on there, and that is uh, this algebra. So I, I won't try to describe its construction, uh, but I do want to regard it as a sort of fundamental uh, non-commutative object. And because it has the same k-theory as and traces of the complex numbers, I'm not allowed to have both z and the complex numbers in my red bubble of things I can classify. And the, the surprising insight is that I should kick out the complex numbers. So we take the complex numbers out of our classification, and we keep this strange non-commutative unit in it, and then it all starts to work. So we will say that a Seastar algebra is Z-stable if this algebra Z 
acts as a tensorial unit on it. Now, there are efficient ways of describing Z stability. It's not you know, totally easy to check, as we'll come back to later, but it can be done, and it can be done without describing the algebra Z at all, which is kind of quite nice. You can say, okay, here is an algebraic condition on your algebra, which tells you whether or not you uh, are acted on as a tensorial identity by Z without needing to know uh, what Z is. And so this becomes a potential boundary line for this classifiable bubble, because of course I can't have both A and A tensor Z in the classifiable bubble unless A was already isomorphic. As that leads us to the statement of the unital classification theorem, uh, you'll notice I've avoided giving any attributations in, in this talk uh, pretty much. So this theorem uh, is the work of many, many hands, uh, many researchers, hundreds of papers. Uh, and so it, it wouldn't make sense to credit the people who sort of took, uh, I think, the final step. Uh, but what it says is that Z-stable, simple, separable, unital, amenable, C-star algebras, which I want to regard as, I mean, in Germany you would have one word for this because you would have smashed all the words together. And, and, and I think we, we, we should really uh, be doing that. That's one adjective, the blue adjective in the middle. Uh, in the UCT class, which is another red thing, uh, classified by K-theorem cases. And this is the, the C-star analog of this Murray von Neumann Hogger uh, classification. And I want to highlight that there's a dichotomy between whether there were any traces or whether there weren't any traces. If there were no traces, this was sorted in the late 90s by Kirschberg and Phillips in a, a profound classification term. And I want to focus on the case where there are traces. I have to say something about the UCT. So the UCT is a, a non-commutative universal coefficient theorem. And like you know, commutative universal coefficient theorems, what it does is compute something that's complicated in terms of something that's less complicated. So the real data that we need to pull this off is, is at the level of Kasparov's bivariant KK theory. And what this UCT class does is means that I don't have to tell you about Kasparov's bivariant KK theory because it's all determined inside this class by uh, K theory. So you should think of satisfying the UCT as being homotopic in a weak sense to a commutative c star algebra. Um, but you shouldn't worry too much about it, because although uh, for some people in this room, the question of whether all separable nucleus Easter algebras satisfy the UCT has, has, you know, consumes a lot of our time, if you write down your Easter algebra explicitly and it's amenable, it will satisfy the UCT, I promise you. So, so in applying it to examples, the condition will, by a lot of deep work, uh, turn out to hold automatically, but proving it in general remains perhaps one of the most pressing problems uh, in the area. So that's the UCT class. What about the range of invariants? Well, if you're going to have a classification theorem, you should know what all of the algebras that are classified are. And it turns out that everything that could possibly arise from com combining K theory and traces must occur, which means we can now prove theorems in the worst possible way, right? We can say, you know, I want to prove the following theorem about all C-star algebras in my classifiable class, so I'll check it in every example. Uh, and this has been done. So one thing that happened in the foundations of the theory is that if you wanted to classify these cross-product algebras, what you needed to do was give them an inductive limit structure, and there's a huge body of work involved in doing that. What you can now do is say, well, by classification, there is some inductive limit structure in one of the models, so it was there in my original example. And so you, trans you discover structure uh, for free as a consequence uh, of classification. Um, you can check at least the blue conditions in many examples uh, reasonably straightforwardly. So uh, this harks back to Shirley's talk yesterday afternoon. So in these cross-product examples, the cross-product Easter algebra will always be unital. It will be separable, having a countable dense subset when G is countable and discrete and X is metrizable. It will be amenable when the group is amenable, or more generally, actually, precisely when the action is amenable, because we can describe uh, amenability there. And it will be simple, at least when the group is amenable or when the action is amenable, under the situation that the uh, action is topologically free uh, and minimal. So these are checkable conditions. And in this situation, the UCT is automatic when the action of G is amenable. This is a result of two that builds on uh, Higgs and Kasparov's work on the Baumkorn uh, conjecture. So 
so all that remains is the Z stability, and, and there's been a huge body of work uh, on this subject uh, over the last 10 years. About 10 years ago, we could prove that all uh, three or all, yeah, all minimal actions of Z on all finite dimensional uh, metrizable spaces gave rise to, rise to Z stable cross products. But over the last 10 years, the class of groups for which uh, this can be done has, has grown. Uh, really dramatically, and, and in particular, results proved here in Münster, the general framework due to David Kerr and, uh, and the results of, uh, of David and Peter showing that, that you can do this very generally for uh, elementary amenable groups. Uh, we discovered yesterday, I mean, there were results uh, that Shirley described yesterday, extending the class yet, yet even further. So this has been a huge growth area. I was trying to toss up the number of papers, sort of maybe 40 to 50 papers on the question of Z stability of these cross products. Okay, so roughly speaking, uh, how does it all work? So, um, firstly, it's a bit of a lie to say that we classify our goal is to classify algebras. All along, we're actually trying to classify maps. So, given uh, these algebras A and B in my classifiable class, what we want to know is when and how unique is there a, a morphism uh, between them. And it's useful that, that the classification theorem is, is in this level of generality because it enables it to be used in much more generality to, for example, classify uh, embeddings. So the classification invariant I care about is up to approximate unitary equivalent. And by classification, I mean both uniqueness. So if I give you two maps from A to B and they agree on the invariant, then they should be approximately unitary equivalent. I should be able to conjugate one onto the other approximately in norm. And it also means existence. So if I give you a map at the level of the invariant, then I must be able to realize this uh, by uh, a map at the level of C. And from all of this, it turns out due to a, an intertwining argument developed by George Eliot, and in the form we use it due to uh, Mikhail Rodham, that um, if you can prove such a classification of maps, then you'll get a classification of algebras as a typo, of course. Uh, I should be lifting an isomorphism between invariants from A to B to a, an algebra isomorphism. You know. But it doesn't look like I've made things any easier because it doesn't seem that it should be any easier to produce a map from A to B than it should be to produce an, an isomorphism. Actually, it is a little easier because an isomorphism is both injective and surjective. And my algebras are simple, so all maps will certainly be injective, but surjectivity is harder to establish, so if I'm trying to prove an existence theorem for maps, I don't have to prove the surjectivity part of it. So it is a little bit easier, but perhaps not a lot. Um, in fact, practice, basically, is, as an analyst, what we kind of know is it's much easier to solve things approximately than it is to solve them exactly. So instead of trying to produce directly a map, what we should do is, is produce a pr an approximate map, a sequence of maps that get a more and more multiplicative as we go down the limit. And the way I want to very quickly, for the purpose of illustration, is to encode this in a, an ultra product device. So um, B omega here is a, a sequence algebra, the sequence L infinity sequences in B, quotiented th by those things that go to zero uh, along an ultra filter for technical reasons. But if you don't like the ultra filter, imagine they go to zero as n goes to infinity. And then a sequence of a star linear maps from A to B that are uniformly bounded and become approximately multiplicative, these will correspond one-to-one -one with uh, maps from A into this uh, ultra product device. So proving you know, the existence of approximately multiplicative maps is genuinely a lot easier than proving e the existence of exactly multiplicative maps. For example, simple infinite dimensional algebras will have no finite dimensional representations, so there'll be no uh, approximately mul uh, exactly multiplicative maps into matrix algebras, but there are many approximately multiplicative maps uh, under reasonable conditions. So we've made the existence theorem a lot easier, but it comes at a price. If you're going to prove existence and uniqueness and you vastly enlarge the class of maps to make it easier to prove existence, you vastly increase the difficulty of proving your uniqueness theorem because you have to prove it for this vastly enlarged class of maps. Uh, so uh, one last slide on how this all works. Well. Uh, it's the interplay between topology and measure theory. So uh, what you can do is you can quotient this uh, ultra product device 
onto a von Neumann ultra product. So you can quotient out by all those sequences that go to zero uh, in the two norm associated to, uh, strictly speaking, all traces, but I'm making a simplifying assumption that B only has one trace. So I'll get a quotient map from B lower omega, the C star norm ultra product, onto uh, the von Neumann ultra product, and then I can appeal to Conn's classification to classify maps uh, from A into this uh, 2 1 factor, and it's a focal uh, consequence of this work that those can be classified by what the map does to the trace. And that turns the whole thing into a lifting problem. So, when can I lift the maps that I can get from A into the von Neumann algebra into the Seaster algebra? And this is where KK theory uh, enters play. There is a KK obstruction to the existence of this lift living in uh, this algebra. You can access that obstruction using the UCT, uh, and when the obstruction can be handled, you can produce your map. And then um, I said that that map was a quotient, so it should form part of a short exact sequence. Here it is. There's a kernel, uh, JB, whatever that is. Uh, and the, that kernel contains the data that you need for the corresponding uniqueness uh, of uh, these maps. So the lift uh, from of these maps from A to the von Neumann algebra will be classified by the KK data, which you access through the UCT. So that's all very technical, uh, and there's a couple of uh, problems I lied slightly, uh, because this KK data, although you can access it using the UCT, it's more complicated than just K theory, which means that you need to add more things to the invariant to prove the uniqueness theorem, which means you have to prove a stronger existence theorem, right? Because I have to prove an existence theorem for the same invariant I had for uniqueness. So that makes proving existence harder. Unfortunately, it stops. At this point, once one proves the existence theorem, it is now strong enough that it uh, is within the same class uh, as the uniqueness theorem. So the takeaway message um, is that the classification of these tracial Seaster algebras has really been obtained now through lifting the von Neumann result to the topological level of Seaster algebras through uh, KK theory. Now, the way I've presented this story, the von Neumann algebras stopped in the 1970s, but of course that didn't happen. There's been many, many brilliant results in von Neumann algebras and the connection between measurable dynamics, Popper's deformation rigidity theory, uh, Jones's subfactor theory and its connections to conformal field theory. And what I hope is that we can expect for much more in this direction for Seaster algebras. So some of those breakthrough work in the 80s, uh, Ocneanu's classification of amenable group actions uh, on classifiable von Neumann algebras, maybe these can be made topological as well, and indeed that started to happen in a really uh, fabulous theorem by Jamie Gabe and Gabor Zabo. And with that, I leave you the Seaster algebras and the von Neumann algebras. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you the ones not close to the field. So first. <laughs> uh, so you made this connection in the very beginning to physics, and uh, can you say a bit more about this? About I think. I mean, so this is, I think, a very interesting thing that that that. For a long time, a lot of the physics has really been coming at the level of von Neumann algebras, and that's because von Neumann algebras come with a natural time evolution. Track. So for every von Neumann algebra, there is a canonical uh, flow. There are many flows on many Seaster algebras, and what we're now looking like we'll be able to do is identify the class of flows that are reasonable, so you'll need to exclude the, the pathological flows, and also classify them. So I, I, I'm hoping that we'll see, I mean, there, the Seaster algebras appear a lot in physics, but I'm hoping that what we'll see is, is ways of building sort of time evolutions on Seaster algebras and, and identifying the natural ones that perhaps coming from some of these classification theorems as opposed to being, being something you can get at in physics. Other questions? <laughs> Coffee. Yeah, so I'm... Break now, so oh, very much. Um, and I think you went 
Okay. <laughs> so we start at 10 past. 